what harm can be done in the name of God, killing, torture, bigotry, and intolerance have all been done in the name of God. It causes undue guilt for things such as drinking, homosexuality, masturbation, watching nudity, premarital sex, dating or marrying unbelievers, not going to church, and not tithing. It has been the cause of the Inquisition, the murder of thousands of non-believers, the Salem witch trials, the burning of innocent people over superstition, and now terrorists. The oldest known religious texts are known as the Pyramid Texts and date to around 2400 BC written in hieroglyphs. The ancient religion began the idea of life after death, a heaven, and God the Father. The Coffin Texts date some 400 years later introduced Osiris, among others, who was the Son of God, lived on earth as a human, and rose from the dead, granting eternal life. The texts tell us that there was judgment after death, and that you would be tortured if you were bad, but entered the kingdom of God, Osiris, if you were good. In 1900 BC, we find the story of a man created from the soil by God, and is introduced to a woman who tempts him with food, accepts, covers his nakedness, and must leave the realm never to return. The story is that of Indiku, found in the first tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest surviving works of literature. On the eleventh tablet we find the story of a great flood. To save our hero, his god told him to build a boat. He gave him precise dimensions, and it was sealed with pitch and bit umen. His entire family went aboard, together with his craftsmen and all the animals of the field. A violent storm then arose, which caused the terrified gods to retreat to the heavens. Ishtar lamented the wholesale destruction of humanity, and the other gods wept beside her. The storm lasted six days and nights, after which all the human beings turned into clay. Our hero weeps when he sees the destruction. His boat lodges on a mountain, and he releases a dove, a swallow, and a raven. When the raven fails to return, he opens the ark and frees its inhabitants. In the end, our hero offers a sacrifice to the gods. This flood story comes some 800 years before the Old Testament. In 1700 BC came Hinduism, along with the ideas of reaping what you sow, being twice born, God can become man, saved not by works alone, and the Trinity. Krishna was a human form of God and was the beginning, middle, and end. He was an animal herder of royal lineage and born of a virgin. But still, the Old Testament has yet to be written. Zoroasterism comes along around 1500 BC and was once one of the most powerful religions in the world. It introduced monotheism, one universal and transcendent God, a God that was all good and no evil. Prayer was fundamental to faith, and baptism was a purifying ritual for a child. The earliest dating for the Old Testament Torah was around 1000 BC, nearly a thousand years after the Epic of Gilgamesh. We know that the Torah could not have been written earlier because it was written in ancient Hebrew, the oldest example of which dates to 1000 BC, whereas the Epic of Gilgamesh was written in cuneiform, one of the oldest written languages. Additionally, the 1000 BC mark makes sense since King David ruled around 1000 BC, followed by the death of Solomon around 900 BC, and the exile around 700 BC. Furthermore, the evidence is very much against Moses having written the Torah. There are many duplicate stories, including two stories of creation, one in Genesis 1, and another in Genesis 2. There are two versions of the Ten Commandments, different number of animals on the Ark commanded, different mountains of revelation, different fathers-in-law's names, and he would have had to have written about his own death. Still, even if he did write it as literus protest, it would still be 400 years after the Epic of Gilgamesh. From the Old Testament, there are five major religions that stem from Abraham, called the Abrahamic religions. They are Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Baha'i Faith, and Druze. 
In 500 BC, Rome is riot with pagan religion, which is often attested to in the Bible. Borrowed from the Greek circa 800 BC, Saturnalia was a holiday celebrated on December 25th for the birthday of the unconquerable sun. It was a festival of light celebrated with many candles. The earliest New Testament books date to 50 AD, around 20 years after the death of Jesus, who was widely accepted to have died around 30 AD. Paul, who wrote the epistles, was not a first-hand account or disciple of Jesus, but he did have a vision of him on the road to Damascus. Paul wrote to the churches to attest to the divinity of Jesus, but never wrote anything about Jesus' birth, life, crucifixion, or resurrection. Mark was the first to give some details of Jesus' life, the earliest gospel dating to around 65 AD. Mark did not know Jesus, as many might think, but wrote down what he remembered from Peter's account after his death. Still, there was no Christmas story or birth of Jesus, no Virgin Mary, no genealogy, no Sermon on the Mount or Lord's Prayer, no resurrection story, and he never states Jesus was the only way to heaven. It is widely known among scholars that Matthew and Luke were not eyewitnesses to Jesus, but mostly copied from the book of Mark some ten years later while adding more to it. Only then do we get the Christmas story, the virgin birth, the resurrection, and the statement that Jesus was the only way. Then, sixty years after the death of Jesus, and nearing death himself at the ripe old age of ninety-five, does John finally dictate the last gospel. It is interesting that the only possible first-hand account of Jesus waits so long to do so, nearly 30 years after the other less reliable authors had already penned their versions. Many people believe that the Bible is the infallible, literal Word of God. This is known as fundamentalism, and it is the reason that people handle snakes or why preachers heal people on TV. But the evidence is clear. The Bible is not without error. In fact, there are over a thousand errors and contradictions in the Old and New Testament, most of them minor. The most irrefutable and serious ones are discussed here. Starting in the Old Testament, we find that there are not one but two separate creation accounts. In Genesis 1, man is created after animals, and in Genesis 2, man is created before animals. God's name was or was not known to Abraham, two different names for God, two different numbers of animals on the ark, different mountains of revelation, and Moses both saw and did not see God's face. Adam should have died after eating the apple. There were multiple gods in the Old Testament, and Cain found a wife out of nowhere. It seems clear that God tempted man. He created the serpent and the tree of knowledge, the tempter, and the object of temptation, knowing what Adam would choose before even creating it. It seems unfair then that God would punish man for Adam's actions, especially considering that God's will is always done. Those who took philosophy may be reminded of the problem of evil, which the Garden of Eden seems to reflect. It goes like this. God exists. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good. A perfectly good being would want to prevent all evils. An omniscient being knows every way in which evils can come into existence. An omnipotent being who knows every way in which an evil can come into existence has the power to prevent that evil from coming into existence. A being who knows every way in which an evil can come into existence, who is able to prevent that evil from coming into existence, and who wants to do so would prevent the existence of that evil. If there exists an omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly good being, then no evil exists. But in fact, God created the evil, the serpent, and tempted man even though the Bible states God would never do that. Of course, the New Testament is arguably more important, more relevant to Christians today. After all, it is the New Covenant, which by the way Jesus never says should replace the Old Covenant. In any case, the New Testament does have some serious errors. Matthew and Luke date Jesus being born before 4 BC or after 6 AD respectively. Matthew and Luke also disagree on the nativity scene. 
They could not agree on if there were shepherds or wise men, the location of the house of Mary and Joseph, the census, whether there were gifts, a star, a dream warning, or the killing of infants. These accounts are so different, there can be little doubt that one or both are in error. One would think that the last words of God on earth would be very important and rememberable, but John and Luke disagree on what his last words were. Luke says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, where in contrast John says, it is finished, and then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is clear that both John and Luke meant this as his last words. Any attempt to rationalize the two is a dishonest reading of the text. Then there's the problem of Mary at the tomb. According to Matthew, Mary Magdalene, and also the other Mary, went to the tomb at dawn on the first day of the week. As they did so, the stone blocking it was moved aside by an angel. Then Jesus came out and said, Greetings, and they held his feet and worshipped him. But in contrast, John has Mary coming to an empty tomb. She comes back down to town and tells everyone someone stole the body of Jesus. In the resurrection, John again does not agree with Matthew. John states that Mary and many other disciples did not recognize Jesus, whereas Matthew says that they do. One last thing to think about. If Jesus was resurrected to the witnessing of 500 people, why are there no accounts outside the Bible? Why not in the first gospel written? Why do Matthew and John not even mention anything about Jesus' ascension into heaven? There are many scientific contradictions in the Bible as well. As we learn more and more about the world around us, it gets harder and harder to reconcile what we know and what the Bible tells us. In ancient times, early astronomers had no clue that the stars and planets were millions of light years away. They believed that the stars were stuck in a firmament, a substance that holds the heavens together and could even be pierced if one got high enough. They also believed in a flat earth, as did the authors of the Old Testament, which clearly states that a tree grew large enough to be seen anywhere on earth. They believed the earth sat on pillars, and in fire-breathing dragons, and in giants. We have yet to find evidence of any fire-breathing dragons or human giants measuring 12 feet tall, and the Bible says that they were not rare at all. In Genesis, the order of creation has plants created before the sun, a problem with those that say a day is like a thousand years, never mind that they are cherry-picking what to take literal or not. But the biggest problem of all is the age of mankind and the earth, the most undeniable proof that the Bible must be flawed. From the genealogy of Genesis 5 and 11, which lists from Adam to Noah to Abraham, with all their ages, it is relatively easy to piece together the age of earth according to the Bible. You get around 6,000 years. We know without a shadow of a doubt that man has been around far longer than 6,000 years, somewhere between 50,000 and 200,000 years, never mind the entire earth or existence. Also, we know that there was a completely different human-like species from us. It was the Neanderthal from sequencing DNA. We know it was not human DNA or even close to it. We know in principle that evolution exists just from observing the fact that we make new breeds of dogs all the time. We know that all these vast numbers of breeds came from the wolf. Every year we design some new designer breed by exploiting natural selection and genetic mutations. In fact, a study was done to replicate domestication of wolves with foxes. They took generation after generation of the tamest of each offspring until traits like spots, floppy ears, and curly tails were achieved. We also know that we have to be careful not to catch bacteria that has evolved to evade antibiotics known as MRSA or staph infections. And only evolution explains why there are different races of people. If we all descended from one man without evolution, we would expect to all be the same race. We can see from continental drift plate tectonics today that continents move about 100 millimeters per year. It explains perfectly how man spread from the Middle East to the rest of the world. And looking at a map, you can just see that the continents would have fit. The Bible has no way of explaining how people traveled to all the continents in 6,000 years. Not a good one, anyway. 
Knight's armor in European museums are generally designed for someone a little over five feet tall. Many of the larger, stronger men of today are over six feet tall. That's evidence of human evolution within just a couple hundred years. As you probably know, a tree creates a growth ring every year. These rings create a pattern of slow and fast growth, and by cross-matching a section against another tree's ring history, the dates are known fully. Anchored chronologies which extend back more than 11,000 years exist in southern Germany. We also know from fossil records that various species of plant, dinosaurs, and animals existed before humans. They are found in much deeper layers of earth and not found alongside human fossils. We have the famous missing links called transitional fossils that creationists used to talk about so much. We know that humans still have the genetic code for tails in their DNA, and sometimes we are even born with tails. Our embryos are markedly similar to those of monkeys, dogs, snakes, fish, and many others, because we belong to the same animal phylum. All these embryos start with gill slits, tails, arm buds, and leg buds. We know that we share 96% of genes with chimpanzees, with the commonality being less and less with other species. In living beings, a virus infection is a commonplace occurrence. Sometimes, viral DNA gets mixed in with our own. The new DNA marker is passed along to our offspring and stays in the genetic code forever. Now, with DNA sequencing, we can unlock every single gene in our 300 billion long genetic code. The chance of a chimp and a human having the exact same DNA marker, the exact same place, is of course 1 in 300 billion. The chances of finding two of these exact same markers in the exact same place is 1 in 4500 followed by 15 zeros. But in fact we share 16 of these markers with chimps, which by chance would be like being struck by lightning 30 times. And that is in only one class of gene. In all there are 98,000 of these virus DNA markers, most of which are in common with chimps. The odds of which are beyond comprehension. The definitive proof is in our genes.